On today's edition of Cronkite Sports Live, the big dance is here and Sun Devil Men's Hoops is in. We've got coverage from Denver as the team prepares for tonight's tournament showdown. Plus, ASU Spring Football is officially underway with Kenny Dillingham at the helm. Find out what's new with the completely revamped program. And finally, ASU Baseball has put together a string of wins. Find out if they can keep it up as conference play kicks off today. All of this and more on Cronkite Sports Live. of Cronkite Sports Live. I'm Sammy Miller and for the first time I have the pleasure of sitting next to the Riley Swenson at the desk for the very first time but it's St. Patty's Day. Where's the green man? Yeah what can I say I missed the memo but uh, the blue really brings out my eyes. So. Oh gosh. But it is indeed March my absolute favorite month of the year mainly because of March Madness. Haven't been too lucky so far with my bracket though. Riley, me either, but hey, ASU men's hoops is a part of the big dance this year. A solid close to the season earned them a first four matchup with Nevada for a chance to take an 11 seed in the round of 64. Now that one went down on Wednesday and we'd love to show you the highlights, but CBS media rights deals would say otherwise. So instead, I took the liberty of putting together this graphical representation of the absolute beatdown that took place in Dayton on Wednesday night. Arizona State defeated the Wolfpack 98-73 in what was easily the team's most complete performance of the season. Riley, I like it, I do, but maybe let the graphics team handle that one next time. But more importantly, the team is moving on. The 11th seed secured in the field of 64, and they take on six-seeded TCU tonight in Denver, Colorado. Here's what head coach Bobby Hurley thinks about the team pushing forward. I mean, we've been on the road a lot. <laughs> we've been traveling, and uh, it's uh, since the Arizona game in Arizona. We've been there to LA's Pac-12 tournament here. And, Let's just keep going. You know, we could sleep. Uh, what's the thing? Don't you, you know? We'll sleep in May or something. So hopefully that'll be it. John Rothstein, we sleep in May. <laughs> like Coach Hurley said, it's been a busy few weeks for the Sun Devils, and the madness continues. Now we bring in our men's basketball reporter Ben Paris to talk about what happened in Dayton on Wednesday night. Ben, in what seemed to be the most dominant victory of the season that came at such a crucial time, what did the team do so well that allowed for that all to happen? Sammy, it's hard to say that they did everything well because Bobby Hurley believes there's always more work to be done, but with the exception of their perimeter defense, they really did do everything quite well and played their best game of the season. The 98 points scored in Wednesday's game were the most in NCAA first four history, was the most for an ASU team in the tournament since 1980. As we look at the shot chart, we see the best shooting performance for the Sun Devils under Bobby Hurley. An impressive 64% from the field on 35 of 55 shooting. ASU was making shots from all over the floor, including 11 from behind the arc. It was the ninth time this season ASU made double digits threes. DJ Horn went seven for 10, including four threes for 20 points, while Desmond Cambridge added 17 and won a perfect six for six from the line. Meanwhile, Jemiah Neal came off the bench and posted a career high 16 points on six of seven shooting while playing 27 minutes in Dayton. The Sun Devils ended the night with 36 points in the paint, 14 fast break points and 14 points off of turnovers. So what fueled, so what fueled ASU's bet, one of the ASU's best shooting performances in program history? Well, Coach Hurley says it was the outstanding defensive performance just as it all has all season long. And a big part of March Madness lies outside of the game itself. The Sun Devils played in Dayton on Wednesday and traveled to Denver to take on TCU tonight. So what are some of the factors to this game that are outside of the X's and O's? So after their win in Dayton, the Sun Devils went directly to the airport at about 1, 1 1.30 in the morning. And from there, it was a three-hour flight back west. So when the team landed in Denver, it was about 2.30 local time. Coach Hurley said he spent his time on the plane watching some film on TCU and was able to get a few hours of sleep on Thursday morning. When he, what he stressed during his media availability before practice yesterday is that traveling is something that this team is used to. They finished their regular season on the road at Arizona, UCLA, and USC before going to Vegas for the Pac-12 tournament. And then from Vegas, they were home for just a couple days before flying to Dayton and now to Denver. So, yeah, the X's and O's are going to be important going into tonight's matchup. But the team was primarily focused on getting their rest and bodies right, along with adjusting to the environment in the Mile High City. And like Coach Hurley said yesterday, we sleep in May. 
an extremely impressive game to say the least, Ben, but it's time to shift our focus to the next round. And to do that, let's bring in our own Matt Venezia, who's in Denver this weekend for the tournament. Matt, what can you tell us about ASU's opponent tonight as the Sun Devils seem to be getting ready just right behind you? Thanks, guys. The Horn Frogs are known for the nation's leading 17.94 points per game on the fast break. However, Mikey Miles Jr.'s and the Frogs didn't quite have the juice the team normally has during the Big 12 tournament. Over the two games that led them to the semifinals, the Frogs only put up nine points on the fast break. What the Frogs did get going was their perimeter shooting at just under 30% during the 22-23 season. They converted at a whopping 43% against the likes of Kansas State and Texas in the Big 12 tournament. On the defensive side of the floor, this is a team that is top 25 in the country in turnovers forced. An area of the Sun Devils game Bobby Hurley and his guys have struggled with time and time again. The Horned Frogs will be without a key contributor to their round of 32 run a season ago with setter Eddie Lampkin Jr. entering the transfer portal after missing time due to personal reasons. His size down low helped him rack up the fourth most minutes on the team for head coach Jamie Dixon this season. His absence could present an advantage for Warren Washington on the glass. TCU went 9-9 nine and nine in the Big 12 earlier this season against some of the best competition, and ASU certainly is not at that level. However, the Sun Devils, if they can channel in what they did in the first four against Nevada, they could keep this thing close at Ball Arena later this evening and try to keep the Devils dancing into the round of 32. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Have fun in the Mile High City. So as we, as we just heard, Ben, tonight is not going to be easy for ASU. What do you think the Sun Devils will need to do to get the win over the Horned Frogs? Yeah, as Matt just said, TCU is an athletic team that scores more fast break points than anyone else in the country. So taking care of the basketball and preventing turnovers, while always important, will be especially important tonight. The Sun Devils don't want to be running up and down the floor with TCU all night, so I wouldn't be surprised if they elect to slow things down a little bit in transition and get into some more half court sets. Three words used to describe TCU by some of the Sun Devil players yesterday were that they're fast, physical, and athletic. So ASU will definitely have their work cut out for them. Decision making will be so crucial as it always is in March. So the Sun Devils will have to rely on their players like Frankie Collins and Devin Cambridge who have played in the NCAA tournament before. Sammy. Thanks so much for the great insight, Ben. Obviously, it's not Bobby Hurley's first time as a coach or a player in the big dance. The former Duke point guard knows how to win in March in between the lines, but hasn't found as much success with a clipboard in his hand. So let's take a look back at Hurley's history dancing in March. Following a 98-73 first four win against the University of Nevada Wednesday night, head coach Bobby Hurley led his Sun Devils into the March Madness round of 64 for the second time. They'll face TCU on Friday in Denver. Hurley's had an up-and-down tenure at the helm in Tempe, which has raised some questions about how far he can lead this ASU basketball program. While his coaching chops may be questioned, his legacy as a college basketball legend is indisputable. Let's take a look back and rewind to the early 1990s when Hurley was the starting point guard for the Duke Blue Devils under legendary coach Mike Krzyzewski. From 1989 to 1993, Hurley teamed up with fellow All-American teammates Grant Hill and Christian Leitner to dominate college basketball. In his four years in Durham, the Blue Devils went to three Final Fours, clocking back-to-back -back national championships in 91 and 92. Hurley earned a Final Four Most Outstanding Player in 1992 and a spot as the consensus first-team All-American in 93, finishing as the NCAA's all-time career assist leader with 1,076, a record still standing today. That number 11 on his back? Well, it was retired from Duke after his graduation in 93. A seven-year pro career followed, with Hurley retiring from playing in 1999. After a 10-year hiatus from the game, Hurley returned to the hardwood as a coach, cycling up the coaching ranks with stops at Wagner College, Rhode Island, and the University at Buffalo, before becoming the ASU head coach in 2015. As a player, Hurley was an intense leader and floor general for the Blue Devils. The 51-year-old has been every bit of that for the Sun Devils. Hurley has yet to find the same level of consistent success he enjoyed as a player. In eight seasons in Tempe, he has an overall record of 140 wins to 112 losses and has an under 500 record in conference play at 71 and 76 in Pac-12 games. Hurley's led Arizona State to three tournament berths, never making it past the first round with the Maroon and Gold. The last time the Devils went dancing was in 2019, getting bounced in the first round by Buffalo 91 to 74. The year before that, Hurley's men got bounced in the first four by Syracuse 60 to 56. Bobby Hurley, the coach, takes the Sun Devils marching into Denver, attempting to find success deep in the tournament for the first time. The same way Bobby Hurley, the player, led his Blue Devils on those famous March runs. This was Devin Henderson, WCSN.
Good history lesson there, and we'll see if Bobby Hurley and company can keep it going. Speaking of heating up, Arizona State baseball has won four straight after a rough start to the month. Pac-12 play kicks off today as the Sun Devils visit Utah. We're going to take a live look in, as you see, they are trailing there in the bottom of the third. Uh, Ross Dunn is on the mound for the Sun Devils. We'll see if they're able to come back in that one. But more from this series in just a bit. But first, to catch us up on what we missed over spring break, we bring in our baseball reporter, Blake Neiman. And Blake, what has been clicking for ASU baseball lately? They went through that tough stretch, losing seven of eight, but what's been going well for them? Well, it's just been a matter of the pitching staff getting out of their weird funk over that losing stretch. They got away from their usual habits and started to try and blow past hitters and focused on their velocity more so than their pitch or selection that they wanted to use against their batters. And ultimately, they took advantage of that, the, the opposing teams did. And pitching coach Sam Peraza said them just focusing on what's on the radar gun really took away from their success and since they've started to focus more on their pitch selection they have been right back on track from where they used to be at the start of the season starting rotation really in rhythm like Ross Dunn starting to work up to his full potential and so just overall locking back into the strike zone and focusing less on velocity has been the key to their success and Blake you just elaborate on the pitching staff and the corrections that they've made how about the hitters at the plate what kind of changes have they made to lead to more success yeah it's kind of funny Riley it's almost been the same sort of dynamic with the hit hitters is that they've been trying to focus on hitting too much stuff outside of their control and outside of the zone but now that they've trimmed their aggressiveness what's inside the strike zone they have been like no one else successfully at the place 39 runs on a combined 50 hits over this winning stretch it has been incredible their success Ryan Campos leading the team with a 714 batting average over this stretch okay, you combine that with Luke Hill who's leading the Pac-12 and hits currently as a freshman can't believe that and then you also add that to the transfers like Luke Kieschel, Wyatt Crenshaw, just uh, top to bottom. This lineup is loaded and it's electric to watch. Absolutely, it is electric to watch. And something else interesting to watch, Willie Bloomquist sounded off on the new pitch clock last weekend, which has been a super hot topic for baseball teams and fans alike. Here's some thoughts from the Sun Devil skipper. But whoever made the rules of this pitch clock stuff are destroying the game of baseball. And, and I'm not afraid to stand up and say it. I've been around the game for a long time, and I, I don't tout that, guys. You guys know me long enough. But enough's enough. Quit screwing with the game. This is an absolute joke. Um, and I'm tired of it. They, they continue to screw with our game and, and destroy what, what has been a great game for a long time because they want to speed the game up. It's a joke. All righty, so we know how Willie feels about it, but Blake, I think we got something set up back here. Maybe want to give it a try at the old pitch clock? Hey, I'll give it my best shot. All right, let's head over and do it. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to put 20 seconds on the clock. When that thing runs down to zero, wherever you're at in your question, you're just going to have to stop, and that's going to be a strike. So we'll start off with the first question right here. What kind of impression has Utah made so far early in this season? Well, similar to ASU, they're kind of sitting around 500, just under at 7-9, and nine, and it's been all dependent on the pitching staff. And if they come out like they can do and th throw 10 plus strikeouts in a game then they're going to be doing pretty well off being one two run close game situations where they can maybe pull out a win but if they do what they do and get outside of their own abilities then they're going to be in some trouble all right blake i'm going to stop you right there that's strike number one right there but also who are some x factors from this utah team that we're going to have to keep an eye on throughout this weekend series there in salt lake yeah certainly the best pitcher in the picking pitching staff so far for utah has been micah ashman with a 1.5 era that leads the team in four saves in his four appearances. He has been really solid and will be a nice fastball against ASU's batting lineup to try and cool them down. And then as far as the hitting lineup goes, Cameron Gurney has been lethal as well and leading the team with a 306 batting average. Well, we'd love to hear more on that, but clock's at zero again. That's strike number two. And just lastly here, how does ASU match up with this team? Well, ASU, as I mentioned, has 39 hits over these past four games, and you compare that to ASU, uh, Utah, rather, who only has eight hits, eight, eight runs over this past few games. It, it's uh, pretty much just a matter of the offense, and with this, the offensive dynamic that ASU has going right now, I don't think Utah's going to be able to stop it. All right, you just barely got that last one in. Good job, as always. Thank you for coming in, Blake. Thank you for your time. And... To see more on some ASU baseball players who have been standing out as of late, here's Ethan Tuttle to tell us who's hot. There are some sizzling hot players in the Sun Devil lineup so far this season, and it's time to update you on the younger guys who have taken the torch to the opponent. Starting it off with freshman second baseman Luke Hill, he's sixth in the Pac-12 in batting average. 
just stunning. He's hitting a 416 right now total. Hill's also top 20 in the country for doubles so far this season. And he was a top five recruit coming out of the state of Louisiana. He's been proving that and has been a big time addition and an X factor for Bloomquist in ASU. Moving over to first base though, it's been sophomore Jacob Tobias with the sure mitt and the solid bat in the box to propel the Sun Devils onto victories early in the season. And when Tobias connects, he connects. He has three home runs on the season so far and is at the top of the stat sheet for the Sun Devils in RBIs with 20. Last year, Tobias's power and plate presence helped him finish as an All-American and is looking to follow up a stellar freshman season with an even better one as a sophomore. And let's not forget the catcher, the guy behind the plate for ASU. Sophomore Ryan Campos established himself last season in the Devils' threads and hasn't really looked back since. Campos has continued his early success in his sophomore year thus far, leading the teams in home runs with four, as well as runs scored with 19. And hey, not to mention, he's ninth in the Pac-12 in batting average. Campos and company are about to ease into Pac-12 play today against Utah for their first conference series of the season. I'm Ethan Tuttle, and that's who's hot. It's officially the beginning of the Kenny Dillingham era with spring football kicking off on Tuesday with almost an entirely new coaching staff as well as many transfers and freshmen who are looking to make a big impact. Practice has looked a little different this time around in terms of pacing. Here's head coach Kenny Dillingham after day one. Yeah, I mean, there's hours and hours of, of work put in. I mean, we even designed certain drills for individual on a certain side of the field because we know the next period is going to be a group or a team drill on the other side of the field right next to it to optimize transition time. So the entire two hour, however long that practice operation is, is definitely orchestrated uh, in all those details. All right, so there is a lot to catch up on. For more on the start of Sun Devil Spring Ball, we bring in our football reporter, Jake Seymour. Now, Jake, this season has already looked way different from last year. What has the intensity looked like so far? Yeah, so right now at practice, the intensity has definitely been kicked up a notch since last season. And really, it's the aggressiveness from the players. Coaches are kind of up in them and advising them through these drills and making sure they're doing it to the best of their abilities. And on top of them just being aggressive, being disciplined a little bit more. Um, just on Tuesday, the first day of spring practice, open to the media. Players, they broke off from the huddle after team stretch and they were forced to go back to it after uh, walking to their stations they did this three three times in order to run to the station by the third time the players finally started running over there and dillingham was happy with, with what he saw and then on thursday during team time they got onto the ball and dillingham didn't like the aggression they were showing so he made them line up on the far end zone and run back to the ball and it was a really quick team drill um, just for that period and with Dillingham coming in, we knew he was going to bring that energy, that enthusiasm. What we didn't know is he was going to be on the field with a mic in his hand, basically emceeing an event. So what have you liked so far from him as a coach? Yeah, emceeing an event is probably the best way to put it because he has speakers going with music playing, which Sean Aguano did bring in towards the second half of last season. But really, it's all any kind of music you think of with him running around with a microphone, talking to his players. But it really comes down to him just putting the aggression into his players from the get-go. He's a high-energy guy, and he wants his players to have that high energy. And one of the things that kind of stuck out from these practices is that he's talked about having the family mantra and being from Arizona and all that, but he's brought his family to all these practices so far. His wife, uh, Brianna, and son, Kent, have been at practice running around uh, behind the end zone. So it's been one of those things where it's like a show, don't tell, and he's been showing that so far in practice. Now, having a good quarterback is essential to having a strong team. We're seeing a lot of new faces in that quarterback room. So, in your eyes, who could possibly take that QB1 spot? Yeah, so it's a little too early to determine exactly who will be starting uh, under center week one. But really, let's just start with Trenton Borgay, the guy who came back last season. Uh, he's the longest tenured quarterback on ASU's roster so far. We haven't seen him in 11s yet. He did have offseason surgery, so maybe he'll make uh, his 11-on-11 11 11 debut later on next week. Uh, but the thing with him is that he came in, he has the experience, but in a new system, new head coach, uh, new coaches across the board. Um, that, I'm not sure exactly how much that plays into it, but then you look at Drew Pine, who kind of highlights the transfer class coming from Notre Dame, led the Funding Irish to a 7-2 record as a starter, and he's a similar size to Trenton's uh, with six foot, 193 pounds, and that pro-style quarterback. In addition to Pine, you also have Jacob Conover, who's from Arizona, went to Chandler High School and was coached by Sean Aguano. He was, uh, came out of 2019. He's a redshirt sophomore right now. And the reason why, because of that, is because he uh, went on a mission, uh, attended BYU before then, so he's a redshirt sophomore coming in now. And honestly, the one that kind of takes a little bit, everyone by storm is Jaden Rashad. He has some NIL problems at Florida, which halted his uh, progression there and transferred to Tempe um, and signed with Tempe uh, this season. Well, it's definitely going to be interesting to see who takes that QB1 spot. Thank you so much for taking the time, spending it with me today. And 
ASU football, there is a lot of moving pieces going on. And as we've talked about before, Kenny Dillingham, this is year one from him. So it'll definitely be interesting to see what the differences are between last year's coach, Herm Edwards, and this year's coach, Kenny Dillingham. And for that, let's send it over to Blake Neiman. So at certain positions you dabble there, I still think you build the foundation of your team with high school players. I am a firm believer in the transfer portal, right, for that reason, is it gives the power to the kids. And that's who needs the power in this deal. That's who this is all about. It's about the players. It's about the kids. And for me, we're going to attack the transfer portal. you got to nationally recruit. You have to try to do that. We have tried to do that. I do think this, as I said it before, the portal hurts high school football. It does. And how do you sign kids? How do you, how do you build a roster? Relationship. Relationship. What does relationship take? Time. Build genuine relationships. And you can't just hop in and, and, and recruit a kid when he's a junior. Like, are we going out to Pop Warner games? That's the reality. Are we building relationships in the community? Are we hosting youth clinics? It's everything it takes a village is the saying. I think you'll see what practices and we got in the hall. That's kind of fun. Get in the hall instead of looking at all the Daffy Duck and you know Mickey Mouse and all those people hold up. There's so many signs in football now. You just get entertained by the signs, right? We got in the hall where the quarterback actually had to call a play. I know what I believe in. Uh, wins games and that's presenting tempo. That doesn't mean that we're gonna snap the ball 80 times a game. I actually don't think that necessarily wins. It means we need to present to the defense that we're gonna snap the ball quickly to make them get a call in. This year, we're throwing the ball out there. You know, I'll get to work with the first group and we'll figure it out. That's just, that's all you can do. And then you gotta make a decision. All right, quarterback here, is he not here? Don't know that. Hopefully he's in the building. We're looking for guys to come in, have a mindset to learn, to grow, to listen. Right? Don't make the same mistake twice. That's it. Don't make the same mistake twice. And that includes somebody else's mistake. You might you might not get the rep, but you heard me coach somebody else. You coach both coach Baldwin, coach somebody else. Did you learn from that rep and did you grow? And that's what we're looking for. The NCAA Wrestling Championships got underway on Thursday and will continue throughout the weekend. To give us an update on how things are playing out and what we can expect going forward, here's Kellen Croxton. Five Arizona State wrestlers started their journeys in the 2023 NCAA National Tournament on Thursday. Of the five, four moved on to the quarterfinals. The first being Brandon Courtney at 125. The graduating senior matched up against Pat Glory from Princeton. Courtney came into the quarterfinals winless against Glory in their two matchups, and with the 6-4 decision this morning, will finish his career 0-3 against Glory. The Sun Devils bounced back at 133, though, as Mikkel McGee gets the 8-2 decision over Kai Oren to become an All-American. In the semifinals, he'll face Roman Bravo Young, the defending national champion from Penn State, who is 18-0 on the year. Moving on to 149, Kyle Parco continued the momentum for the Sun Devils as the All-American beat Brock Mahler 4-3 and will face two-seeded Sammy Sasso in the semifinals. On the other side of the bracket will most likely wait Yanni Diakamahalis, who is seeking his fourth consecutive national title. Finally, at 285, five-seeded Colton Schultz took on four-seeded Cassiope. Schultz would go on to lose in sudden victory and end his run at the championship. Well, that's all the action so far in Tulsa. But with the semifinals starting today at 5 p.m., Arizona State still has two wrestlers looking to claim a title. ASC softball is currently in Stillwater, Oklahoma for the Oklahoma State Mizuno Classic. They started things off with UCF this morning, but it was a struggle as the Knights threw a no-hitter, winning 8-0 in six innings due to the mercy rule. Game two just finished up a little bit ago as the Sun Devils fell to Oklahoma State 1-0 in a pitcher's duel. Pitching has been an interesting part of the team this year, and the Sun Devils' new head coach, Megan Bartlett, manages her staff a little differently than most softball programs. Our Max Zepeda has more on ASU's bullpen and how it compares to others. For many premier softball programs across the country, the strategy of how to operate a pitching staff is mostly simple to understand. Top-tier programs like Oklahoma, the defending national champions, have had four players step in the circle in 2023, with only two having over 40 innings pitched. 
On the other hand, UCLA, arguably the most complete team in the Conference of Champions, has also had four pitchers throw, including two with over 50 innings on their resume. However, here in Tempe, first-year head coach Megan Bartlett is setting a new normal for the Sun Devils, as Arizona State has not had a single pitcher reach 40 innings so far this season. Bartlett has run her pitching staff in an unorthodox form in comparison to those elsewhere. With five pitchers on the roster, Bartlett manages her bullpen in a similar manner to baseball programs. The staff consists of figurative starters like Mac Osborne and Kylie McGee, relievers like Kenzie Brown, and closers like closer Deb Jones and Marissa Schuld. Schuld and Brown also have a combined total of five starts in the season, while Jones has seen some time as well as a reliever. So we've got a great pitching staff and they complement one another well and they support one another well, but the reality is that hitters in college softball are really, really good. Really, that is what our game has become. It's a little bit more like baseball, right? Starters and middle relievers and closers, and you're trying to create matchups. Our coaching staff, so we're going to use our wits to our advantage and try and create the best matchup. But while Bartlett has experimented with this format, the truth is the pitching so far in 2023 has been a mixed bag. From handing out the second most walks in the Pac-12 with 62 to holding a team URA of 2.77, which is around the nationwide average. The truth is, there is still so much more work to be done to make this Sun Devil pitching core one of the premier staffs in the country. A statement that will test yet again itself this weekend in Stillwater, Oklahoma, when they face two of the nation's most consistent offenses in number two Oklahoma State and near top 25 program, Central Florida. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks for that, Max. Although the softball team may be struggling, at least they didn't lose to Princeton in the first round of the tournament, am I right? Anyway, speaking of tournaments, the ASU Gymnastics Squad is competing in the Pac-12 Championships this weekend. And to give us an update on where they stand heading into the event, here's Grace Del Pizzo. This Saturday, ASU is headed to Utah to compete in the Pac-12 Championships, but the question on everyone's minds is which version of the team will show up? ASU took a while to get going in their first five meets. Through the first half of the season, the Sun Devils failed to score above 197 and had a 4-4 four four record. However, in their next four meets, the Gym Devils really hit their stride. Three of their scores landed among the top 15 in program history. They went 3-1 with upset wins over number 4 Utah and number 11 Oregon State. Although the Gym Devils had been on a skyward trajectory, they didn't quite stick the landing in their last meet of the regular season. Against number one Oklahoma last week, they finished with a 195.925, their lowest score since the 195.775 they scored in their first meet way back on January 7th. This Saturday, ASU will compete in session one of the Pac-12 championships against the other three teams in the bottom half of the conference. ASU and number 19 Stanford met in the Beauty and the Beast meet in the Pac-12 opener for both sides. The Gym Devils were still seeking to put together a complete meet, and they fell just barely short as the Cardinal came from behind to win the meet in the final rotation. The very next week, ASU jump-started its run of success in the Territorial Cup against in-state rival Arizona. This time, the Gym Devils held on to the lead the entire meet, and senior Hannah Scharf led the team to their seventh straight Territorial Cup victory with her 39.4 in the all-around. Almost a month later against Washington, the Gym Devils earned their highest true road score in program history in a narrow win over the Huskies. Washington's season-high 197.25 was not enough to overcome the Gym Devils, propelled by Sharp, who once again excelled in the all-around. So which team will compete on Saturday? The shaky Gym Devils from January who resurfaced last week? Or the team that went on an absolute tear in February? The Gym Devils hope they can close their tale of two seasons with a fairy tale ending at the Pac-12 Championships and keep their momentum rolling into NCAA Regionals. Thank you for that, Grace. The Sun Devils open up action tomorrow at 12 p.m. in Utah. They'll be in Session 1 against Stanford, Washington, and Arizona and ASU, the highest ranked team among those four. So theoretically, they should get it done, but as we know this time of year, no one is safe. So again, that's 12 p.m. tomorrow in Utah when the Sun Devils open up the Pac-12 Gymnastics Championships. The madness has officially begun. Exactly a month ago, I sat at this desk and said, maybe, just maybe, ASU's gritty underdog mentality might just be enough to get it done and punch a ticket into the big dance. Turns out, it was enough. Well, enough to get into the first four. But that's all the Sun Devils were asking for. They just wanted an opportunity to make a Cinderella run, and that wish came true. First up, Nevada, a team that Desmond Cambridge Jr. and Warren Washington knew a little something about. 
And these Sun Devils not only beat the Wolf Pack, they destroyed them 98 to 73, scoring the most points ever in this stage of March Madness. But the Sun Devils walked off the court knowing that this was only the beginning. Now they officially earned a spot in the round of 64 and their next opponent awaits, six seeded TCU. Tonight, they have an opportunity to keep the dream alive. Coaches always say they want their team to peak in March. Well, it's March 17th and these Sun Devils are red hot. Their offense is flowing, draining threes left and right, attacking the rim, bringing that pit bull mentality to the hardwood, just like their head coach does. In his 10th season as a collegiate head coach, Bobby Hurley has never advanced past the round of 64. Now he gets his fourth chance. There aren't too many people hungrier than the two-time national champion Duke point guard. He understands what it means to be a player competing on the biggest stage, and that energy he brings is driving his team to new heights. It's March Madness. Anything, and I mean anything, is possible. And maybe, just maybe, that gritty underdog mentality might just be enough to dance in Houston. And that's the way it is. Time for some top plays here. We start out at number four. Luke Keyshaw leaving the yard, giving a little flip there. He knew that one was gone right off the bat. Sun Devils roll to a 9-1 victory over Utah Tech on Tuesday. And we have another takedown for you for number three. It's ASU Wrestling. Look at Colton Schultz putting him down. Yeah, and I don't really know what's going on here. It seems like he's just kind of sitting there for a while. I thought the goal of wrestling was to not be on your back, but he's just kind of hanging out. Seems pretty okay with where he's at. Maybe taking a little nap while he's at it. And Riley, I'm a bit confused. I feel like the ref should not just be laying there. Shouldn't he be doing something? Yeah, maybe, but uh, looks pretty comfortable there and obviously gets the win. Big time win for the Sun Devils on that one. Moving on to number two, Josh Doan playing his last game in a Sun Devil sweater we found out this week. That's what we call a Geno, folks. That will be his last goal in a Sun Devil uniform at Mullet Arena. He opened up the arena with the first goal and he closes it out overtime win over Long Island. And for number one, for the first time in ASU men's swimming and diving program history, the Sun Devils are Pac-12 champions, snapping a streak of five consecutive Pac-12 championships by the Cal Golden Bears. And next up for ASU is the NCAA championships in Minneapolis on March 22nd. Well, Sammy, the Sun Devil men's hoops team in action tonight, as is the rest of March Madness, both the men's and women's team. So enjoy that. That's all the time we have for you today. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and we'll see you next time on Cronkite Sports Live.